This is the VoiceOver Marketing Podcast, episode number 68. Oh, jeez. Hey there, this is Steve Stansel from South Florida, and you're listening to the VoiceOver Marketing Podcast with John Melly. Pretty cool, huh? Hey there, it's John. How are you? Thanks for spending some time with me today. I do appreciate it, and Happy New Year! Man, I have missed doing podcast episodes. It has, last fall, the last quarter of 2018 was crazy. I fortunately had a lot of projects, voiceover projects and production projects come in, and I received voice messages, I received questions, I received emails, and I apologize. I wanted to get this episode out sooner, but I just couldn't. I had clients who who needed their stuff, and I'm still working through a bunch of it, but I had ideas after ideas that I wanted to share with you, and now... I'm putting my publishing calendar for the year together, um, both for the podcast and for voiceoverathlete.com, and uh, I've got some other things that I'm working on having fun with. But man, I have so much I wanted to share with you. So this is going to be an episode of kind of catch up and answering some Q&A and also congratulating listeners who have sent me some email and feedback from coaching and some successes and victories and and people just getting started and all that kind of stuff. But I want to tell you that um, I have a public service announcement for my fellow voiceover and production people. And uh, please learn from my experience. Some of the projects that I've been working on have been in producing programs for audiologists, people who work with people who have hearing loss. And as I was talking with these people, these doctors of audiology, it's fascinating. Um, I started to, <laughs> pardon the pun, it's not intended, but I guess I'll go with it anyway, listen very carefully to what they were saying. And I thought, you know what? I, I need to get my hearing checked. I've been at this game a long time. I have sat in a studio with loud music, loud sound effects. Sometimes the louder the better. I almost wanted to feel the music. Um, Headphones on during recording sessions. Sometimes I I hardly ever use headphones anymore just because I I think you get a better performance when you don't use headphones. But if I'm online with somebody down the other end and they're coaching me remotely or giving me notes on how they want a performance, you know, I have to have the headphones on so I can hear them. At any rate... I'm also a drummer, and I've also been known to go to the gun range on occasion. And I have been in marching bands with loud drum lines behind us. I've played in bands for uh, since I was in elementary school, all the way up through college, in small band rooms, enclosed spaces, etc. And Johnny Boy here has a hearing loss. And... I am giving you my little pitch to protect your hearing because I am the proud owner of a couple of uh, hearing devices. It, it, this was a tough pill for me to swallow, I'll be honest with you, never mind the financial <laughs> cost. Um, but there are ways to figure it out. And if it's important, I've always said this, if it's important enough for you, you find a way, you know, you find a way to pay for it. Whatever is important, you spend money on what's important to you. My point is, is that our ears are (laughs) important tools. And I'll say this. I may actually repurpose an interview I did with a doctor, a doctor of audiology. I didn't know this, but hearing loss increases your risk of developing dementia by 200%. I did not know that, but I found that out. I'm fortunate that neither of my parents have dementia. My dad wears hearing aids. And... They looked at my hearing loss, and it was due to exposure. And talking with other audiologists, we live in a noisy world. And particularly us folk who work with sound, we really need to protect our hearing. So let me put this out here, out there to you. If you ride around in a lawnmower, or you push a lawnmower, or you use a snowblower or a leaf blower, use hearing protection. Don't just put the earbuds in and listen to the music louder than the machine to drown out the sound of the machine. 
that's doing damage. <laughs> you don't want to do that. You want to protect your hearing. So get some earplugs. Get some earmuffs. Get, get hearing protection. I don't have a lot of hair, as many of you know, because you've seen my picture and you may have seen my videos. But if you use a hair dryer, use earplugs. If you use a vacuum inside your car, wear earplugs. If you use a blender, you work in a loud environment, wear earplugs. Wear hearing protection. Wear something to protect your hearing. Because there are a whole host of issues. Uh, if you're a diabetic, you, I, I learned all of these things. I am not a diabetic, but um, if you are a diabetic, it, it increases your risk of a hearing loss because the blood flow is altered when you have diabetes and the small capillaries that feed blood to your nerves in your ears and your hearing nerves, etc., it gets diminished. The blood cells can't get into those capillaries. Who knew? Heart disease. All of these things are all tied in with hearing loss. And it's one of the things, I guess this is uh, a little self-serving, but it's one of those things that I talk about in the voiceover athlete all the time is that everything matters. Everything is connected. You are an athlete. You use your body to perform your job. And so get your hearing checked. If you're thinking about it, I was embarrassed. I was afraid. I work in a radio station, and there's this expectation, whether or not it's spoken or not, or what something that I put upon myself was like, are they going to question my ability to do my job because I have uh, diminished hearing? I don't now, because I have these nifty doohickeys that I stick in my ear every day. Um, yeah, that's been going on, too. <laughs> I've been having my own little emotional struggles about this. And uh, I, I felt, you know, I was disappointed in myself. If I had only paid attention, if I'd only taken better care of my hearing, if I had only uh, worn hearing protection, if I had listened to the music a little more softly. Uh, as somebody said, what you enjoyed all of that. And I said, yeah, I did. I do. You know, I play the drums. And I, <laughs> I always wore hearing protection playing the drums. But I, there was some regret. Uh, but I have had to get over that uh, because I need to take care of myself. And I was a little afraid to go to family functions with these. My wife obviously knows I, I have hearing uh, loss or, or hearing. I wear hearing devices now, hearing aids. They're pretty amazing. I guess I'll take a picture of my hearing devices and, and put them on this episode's show notes. I have a prescription, and it took a while for them to bring the prescription up to the full prescription. They didn't just set it at, you know, 100% and have me wear them. It would have been overwhelming for my brain, literally. So what they did was they figured out where it needed to be eventually to get it back to quote-unquote normal hearing. And I don't have the time to go into what normal hearing is in this episode because there's a whole bunch of other things I want to talk about. What they did was they said, here's where you need to be. Here's where we're going to start you. And you're going to come in every couple of weeks. We're going to see how you're doing. We want you to tell us what's happening, what your thoughts and experiences have been like wearing these. We want you to wear them 12 to 15 hours a day to get the maximum benefit. And uh, then they slowly increased all the different parameters until it got to my full prescription, which happened early December. And uh, they, it was moving along, and I actually had them back it down. They, were, they wanted to move it faster, but it was going too much for me. It was, some of it was becoming too loud. And now I'm at a point where it's, it's fine. I, I've adjusted to these. And I was talking with another audiologist, and they asked me how these were working out for me. And I said, you know, I think I've gotten to a point where I don't even notice them uh, because I got into the shower with them the other day. And they said, oh, that's a good sign. And I said, yeah, they only got a little wet, but um, I figured I didn't even notice I had them on. So they must fit and feel natural at this point. And so they said, yeah, yeah. And I guess they can be on, underwater for 30 minutes or something like that. But <laughs> why chance it? But they're pretty amazing things. Uh, they're Bluetooth. They sync to my smartphone. I can listen to audiobooks. Oh, I have such a cool audiobook that I want you to listen to. I'm going to tell it to you before I forget it. It's called The Stuff of Thought 
um, by uh, Steven Pinker. S-T-E-V-E-N Pinker, The Stuff of Thought. It's on Audible. I'm not even going to put a link to it in the show notes because, uh, you know, whatever. I don't need the affiliate commission or anything like that. I mean, I'd love it, but I'm not even going to bother. Steven Pinker, The Stuff of Thought. If you want a deep dive on language and how important language is, and you know, I'm kind of a nerd on this stuff because we work with words and scripts and all that kind of stuff, and we want to communicate ideas, this is really, <laughs> if you want to geek out, this is an interesting book, The Stuff of Thought. He talks about, uh, just to, to wet your whistle a little bit on this book, it starts off with the World Trade Center on 9-11 and the insurance policy on whether or not the person who held the insurance policy was going to get $3.5 billion in insurance or $7 billion in insurance. And it all came down to how the word event was defined. And just to give you an idea, event, you know, the 9-11 the event, the events of 9-11, when the World Trade Center towers came down, was it two events or one event? You know, it all hinged on, you know, three and a half billion dollars hinged on how one word was defined. Um, so if you want to do a deep dive, The Stuff of Thought by Steven Pinker. Really cool. Anyway, um, getting back to the hearing aids. <laughs> I can listen to audiobooks with my hearing aids. That's where I was with that. So my advice is get your hearing checked. My wife, Ann, you know, when she would be in another room, I'd be like, what? Huh? And at one point she said, I didn't know you couldn't hear me. I just thought you weren't paying attention. And that really struck a chord with me. It didn't hurt me. I just felt badly uh, because she's such a patient woman <laughs> uh, in many ways because <laughs> she's living with me. <laughs> And, folks, let's face it, I'm not right in the head, okay? I, I, I can be difficult. And in many ways, I can be very easy to live with, too. I'm, I'm pretty chill. But um, whenever she said, oh, I just didn't think you were paying attention to me, I was like, oh. And when I first had them, the first meal that when we were having dinner, you know, we sit at, at the dining room table and we have dinner. And during that first meal, she said to me, you're speaking so much more quietly than you have in the past. I said, really? And I was telling the doctor about it, and he said, well, yeah, you're not l yelling in order to hear yourself. <laughs> so if you have, let me ask this question. Are you w watching television or are you reading television? Because I was putting subtitles on. Because I was like, oh, it's just the new TVs. You, you know, they have such small speakers. You know, you rationalize all this stuff. And, uh, you know, I was putting the subtitles on and I was thinking, oh, well, it's British television. I, they have the accents. I can't really, you know, I need the help. Really? <laughs> um, I don't use the subtitles anymore. Your environment plays into it. So if these things are happening with you, get your hearing checked and protect your hearing wherever you can. I use a Nutribullet to make smoothies in the morning. I put on hearing protection when I use the Nutribullet or the blender or anything like that. I love to work in the yard. If I use a leaf blower or a lawnmower or a snow blower, I'm wearing hearing protection. I'm repeating myself. I'm repeating myself. But it, anyway, consider it a public service announcement and a true confession. So the reaction, you know, I, was, I told you I was being self-conscious and uh, feeling kind of bad about this whole thing and beating myself up, which I love to do. Actually, I don't love to do it, but I'm really good at it. You know what I mean? You're a voiceover person. You get it. It's all subjective, and you're your harshest critic, right? Yeah, I know. I get it. I get you. You get me, too. Anywho, which is why we get along so well. So what was the reaction? Well, I slowly... One person saw them. So what are those? What are you doing? And I said, well, I've had my hearing tested, and I have a hearing loss. And they said, well, I'm really glad that hasn't happened to me yet. <laughs> and I tried to turn the volume down on them, but I can't because they're, they're a person and they don't have a volume control. Only they can control the volume. <laughs> and I laughed and I was thinking to myself, oh, you think so, but yeah, you do. You do. 
I, I've noticed so many more things. But I, I'm not saying that to people like, hey, you've got a hearing loss. I mean, you don't want to be that guy. If anybody asked me, I would say, yeah, you, you know, you may want to get your hearing checked. But the interesting thing is people are starting to ask questions about them. And nobody has questioned my ability to be able to do my job. In fact, it's made my editing different and easier. Whereas before I would rely on the graphic representation of the waveform in my editing software uh, and notice things. And I would pick up on things and I would go looking for it. Now I hear it during the recording session and then I go back and find it and edit it and clean it up. And I'm noticing a lot of nuances so that was one environment. The other thing was I was nervous was being in fa family situations. And I'm the oldest in my family, aside from my folks. My dad's 82 and my mom just turned 78. Sorry, Ma, I shouldn't have said that. But, you know, so I, I'm thrilled that they're still healthy. And, I mean, they're still driving. They're still living in their own home. They're still doing their thing. They're living their lives, you know, um, and I'm very grateful for that. But I was thinking, you know, I feel old and I don't feel old, you know, because I feel young. I feel very fit, but my my hearing has taken a bit of a beating. And it was it was tough to admit that. And I'm still kind of reconciling myself with it. That takes time. But I have a tool and it's made my life better. And so when I went up for Christmas, my birthday is right around Christmas. So I went to my parents' house and I said, I got something I need to share with you to my mom. And she looked at me kind of concerned. And I had been in the house for about an hour at that point. Nobody notices them. They're so small. And uh, I pulled one out of my ear. I said, I got hearing device, hearing aids. And you know what she said? She said, oh, good. I was hoping you'd at least get it tested. I was very concerned, something along the lines. I was very concerned given what you do with the headphones and the music and the speakers and the studio and all that, that you might have diminished hearing. And you don't want to go through what your father and I have gone through because my dad... <laughs> God love him. He has a hard time hearing. He had a virus in one of his ears and it diminished his hearing tremendously. And my mom <laughs> would be yelling at him, you need to get your hearing checked. And it really does put a strain on a relationship. And so she was, I was so surprised. And then my brother came in. Like I said, they're all younger than I am, but they're all musicians. And, um, this episode turned into something I didn't expect it to, uh, which is fine. But, uh, you know, cards on the table. So my brother came up and said, hey, I noticed uh, you have something behind your ears because I was, I was seated at the kids' table and he was at the grown-up table. And I'm there with my nieces and nephews giving them business and all that kind of stuff. And he, he was on the table behind me and he, he looked over and he saw them behind my ears. And so he came and he said, what's going on? I, so I told him. And then another brother came up, and I told him. And then my sister, I saw her on my mom's birthday. She's a New Year's baby, so we celebrated it a little early. And it's a busy time in my family. We got two birthdays, New Year's and Christmas and Christmas Eve, all within a one-week period of time. And uh, it's fun. It's a lot of driving. And then my sister said to me, yeah, I noticed that at Christmas. What's going on? How's it working for you? And I thought I was going to get razzed. I thought I was going to get given a hard time. And it was just the opposite. I was so surprised. And I'm grateful for that. And people at work have, uh, I think pretty much everybody knows. My boss knows. Colleagues know. Some of them noticed from behind because, like I said, I don't have a lot of hair. So it's not, you know, I don't have hair hiding them. Um, but some people don't know, and they haven't even noticed. They, uh, and when I do tell them, they go, oh, my God, I had no idea. I can't even see them. So that was some of the stuff I was wrestling with. 
uh, you know, had a lot of that going on, a lot of running around, getting to and from appointments, getting that all checked and everything. It was really kind of cool what they did after they did the hearing test and after I got the hearing aids. You know, they set them, and then after the first appointment, I think I had them for a week and a half or something like that, and I went back in, and they were able to stick these tiny little microphones inside my ears where it, when I, while I was wearing the hearing aids, and they would test them to make sure that what I was supposed to be hearing, that all the settings were accurate. And they would use the microphone to measure the sound and the frequency spectrum of the sound being put into my ear through the hearing devices. And they were able to measure that. And if they had to recalibrate it, but it was real. I mean, this was like this fiber optic microphone. It's fascinating. Fascinating technology. And, uh, you know, I was talking with one of them. I said, you know, I've got a whole studio full of rack space with rack component equipment to tweak and massage the sound in a way that I want to create it. And you've got essentially the same thing on two little tiny supercomputers that hang on the back of my ear and feed through a little speaker cable into a, a speaker that puts the sound right at my uh, my ears, and it's got a limiter, it's got a, an attenuator, it's got, it's got an EQ, it's got it's it's fascinating. So anyway, that was that. Another thing that happened in early December was my wife and I adopted my brother's dog. We have now a beagle named Zoe. She is 11 years old, almost 12. And the reason we had to adopt her was because my nephew, who's six, uh, the poor guy, he's, uh, he's allergic to her. And it was very bittersweet. I, I hated the circumstances of um, having to do this because I just feel terrible that, you know, my brother and his wife have to give up their dog that they've had for ever since she was a puppy. Uh, she's a wonderful dog. And my nephew, who's known her his entire life, and he's very upset about it. And Ann and I discussed it for a long time. We, well, it wasn't a long time, but we talked about it in depth. And we said, you know what? We can give her a good home. And so in early December, we, we took her. You know, it's been bittersweet. I mean, I feel terrible for my brother and his family because uh, it's been difficult for them. But the consolation is, and I've been told this, is that they know that she's being well cared for. And so Zoe the Beagle is now in our home, and I have fallen in love with this dog. She is an absolute joy. My brother and his wife, they trained her beautifully. She's fun. She's obedient. She's energetic. She's going to be 12 in March, and she's still feisty as all get out. And she behaves, and she listens, and she loves to be outside. And when I walk in the back door every day, she's there wagging her tail and happy to see me and playful and all kinds of good stuff. And I just love to sit with her and pet her. <laughs> and I think that's why they call me Mushmelly. Anyway, um, I talk a tough game, but uh, deep down, I'm a softie. I'll admit it. But yeah, Zoe, I guess I'll put a picture of Zoe on the page too for this episode's show notes. So that's been uh, my world, work, health, and wellness with the dog. I'll tell you about some other things that have happened, some sad things that have happened, uh, but some very good things that have happened too. But I'll save those for other episodes that are coming. So let's get to some interesting stuff here. I want to tell you about Andy Packard. Andy was a coaching client of mine last year, and on my birthday, by coincidence, Andy sent me an email, and I'm going to read you his email, and I'm going to pick it apart because I'm going to. There are a lot of lessons here. Here's the email. Hey, Mr. John, thank you for your guidance and time from our August coaching session. So this was back in August. It helped me understand what is feasible and where I should target my career beginning in voiceover. Now, this line is what it's all about. This next line is what it's all about. After 72 auditions, I landed my first audiobook. An incredible project and learning experience. And then he gives me a link 
to um, the audio book. And, Andy, I'm going to put a link to this audio book on Audible in the show notes so people will be able to go download it. Hopefully you'll make some money off of that. And then after the link, he goes on to say, without you to point me north, I would still be fumbling along frustrated. Thank you again and happy holidays to you and the family. All the best. Andy Packard. And then his web address. And, you know, I didn't get a lot of physical presents on my birthday. I got some great birthday messages from friends and from my nieces and nephews and families. They sent me recorded uh, songs and uh, birthday greetings, not just happy birthday to you, um, but, you know, they made up their own things and sent me these creative things. One, one of them did a puppet show that said happy birthday to me. Another one played his uh, drums to me, you know, and the others were at the Statue of Liberty singing to me. I mean, it was just really fun to get all these different greetings. But I emailed Andy and I said, man, you just warmed my heart. You just gave me a really cool birthday gift. To know that the coaching made an impact and helped, you know, yeah, Andy paid me money. And the money is a two th- two step thing, and I-, I talked a little about this in the last episode. When you invest in yourself, it makes you a better customer. When you invest in a workshop, you pay better attention. And I've said this: how many free PDF downloads do you have on your computer? Free reports, free techniques, free marketing tips, all that kind of stuff. Do you have that you've never read, and you don't treat them with respect because it, eh, it was free. I'll get to that later. But hey, when you get your phone bill or when you get your mortgage bill, you open that up. (laughs) Better pay that. Better pay attention. Right? It's the same thing. If you invest in yourself, it makes you a better student. And my time is worth it. But here's what I want you to understand. To get this email from him, I I can't tell you what that meant to me. It was awesome to think that I... I, I spent an hour on the on the phone with Andy back in August, and four months later, he took the time to write me a thank you note. And four months later, what we worked on together wasn't just me, but Andy and I worked together on that hour. He found something in it, in that process, that gave him the drive to go through 72 auditions to get his first audiobook, which he says, I'm, I'm assuming he's talking about the, the audiobook was an incredible project and learning experience. I would go so far, and if that's what you mean, I get it, but the, that 72 auditions <laughs> was also an incredible learning experience, too. I bet. That 72nd audition was so much better than the first one. And to know that I was part of that and helped Andy with that was so huge. That's so gratifying. I get such a... And that's why I love this podcast. Andy and I would never have met if it wasn't for the Voice Over Marketing podcast. All the people that I've talked to, all the people that have reached out to me through the various channels... I would never have met you if it wasn't for this podcast. And so I love this podcast, and that's why when I can't do it or when I don't have the time and the resources to be able to devote to it, I get kind of bummed out. I'm like, oh, I really want to share this, you know? And so, Andy, I want to thank you again, and I am going to put a link to your audio book on the show notes for this episode, episode 68. Congratulations, and again, Thank you for sending me that email. It just warmed my heart, and I'm still living off of it. It was just fantastic. So anyway, we have a couple of voice questions that came in, too, through the SpeakPipe app. Let's take a listen to Samita. She sent me a SpeakPipe message back in November. And Samita, you've been very patient waiting. It's almost two months later. I get it. I'm sorry. Samita's like, when are you going to answer my question? I'm like, I would love to. I've just been crazy busy. And uh, so let's listen to her question now. Hi, my name is Samita. Um, I live in Vancouver, B.C., I have just started out with just this idea that I want to enter this market of voiceover 
narration. After putting a lot of thought to it, I was thinking of what my niche could possibly be, and I would really be interested in narrating audiobooks for children books, uh, self-help, motivational books. At least that's my area of uh, interest. Now, how to get started, how to make demos, how to get somebody to mentor me, or even to do this on my own, some guidance would be very much appreciated. I would really like to put this in action as I feel this would be really something that would be for self-improvement and very satisfying to me. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Samita. I appreciate you reaching out and asking that question. Audiobooks. Yeah. So what do you need to do? How do you get started? It sounds like an obvious question, but it is a great question because it implies that you understand that there is an awful lot that you need to know about before you really dive in on this. So let me say this about that. You are going to need to, I'll go to square one, and this is true for any type of voiceover performance. It is a performance. So voiceover is voice acting, and I think Rodney Salisbury uh, is the person who first said that to me years ago, and he's right. If you don't have any acting experience, I would find out about that. I would spend some time learning some acting. Because if you're going to be doing children's books, there is a whole style and delivery for children's books. And it can be different than other types of audiobooks. You know, you wouldn't necessarily do a scientific journal the same way you would do a child's uh, a children's book, you know. Um Particularly if you've got some, uh, sometimes you might be doing some character portrayal. Uh, you need to be able to do that. You need to be able to hold on to that character consistently throughout the book. Depending on the length of the book, that can be easier in some cases than in others. Children's books tend to be a little bit shorter. But if you've got some dialogue with a character in chapter one, and then that character shows up again in chapter seven, and that's maybe an hour or so later in the audiobook, that's probably going to be four or five hours later in your recording session. Because I have found that my editing, when I've done audiobooks, that I'll, I'll spend like, yeah, that's probably more like a, an hour and a half to two hours in the recording session. All depends on how fast you're moving through the material and how many retakes you're doing, obviously. But I've found that it's about three hours of editing for every one finished hour of audio. So the thing is, is you've got to remember how you portrayed that character at one point in the book, and then you portray it again later on in the book. And there may be a large amount of time between that character's appearances in the book. But it still needs to sound the same. The listener needs to know that, oh, yeah, it's that character. Uh, we're back there. That can be challenging. Uh, and I would say that for a lot of fiction or any any type of book that you're doing where you're doing roles. The other thing that you're going to learn is that in an audio book, when you're voicing an emotion, you want the listener to feel the emotion being conveyed in the book through the story from the activities and actions of the various characters. You don't want to perform it in a way that feels the emotion for the listener. You want to create and deliver the story in a way that the listener feels the emotion. So if you're, if you're doing a scary part of the book, you don't want to sound like, and then I walked down the hallway and opened up the door, and then the goblin jumped out and scared me. You don't do it that way. You say, I walked down the door. It was quiet. The floor was creaking. I could hear my breath. I slowly turned the knob on the door as it creaked open. The goblin... You know, I mean, you get it. You want to create the suspense that will create the, oh my gosh, what is going to happen? So that's, that's something else. That's just a performance tip. Here's what I would do. And I get no money whatsoever for making this rec recommendation. If you want to learn how to do audiobooks, you need to go sign up for Pat Fraley's audiobook workshop. 
And here's why. It's a two-day event. It's a killer workshop. It's a little, you know, I mean, it's more than what most workshops are. But here's the thing. If he's still doing it the same way he has in the past, you come out of there with a demo, an audiobook demo that you can use to promote yourself. So, Samita, I would do that. I would look into workshops on how to do audiobooks. It is a very specific genre. It is different from other types of voiceover. It's certainly different from commercial voiceover, movie trailer voiceover, promo voiceovers. Uh, It's different from video game voiceovers. It is its own thing. The other thing I'd tell you is that you better be ready for the long haul. And I mean that in terms of stamina for recording because it goes on for hours. I work on primarily commercials and different types of short form audio, Uh, short form meaning um, three minutes or less. And uh, I, I extend it to three minutes because I do a lot of podcast intros and outros. And even then those are 60 seconds or less, but to be generous, I'll go three minutes. That's a whole different ball game than an audiobook. Audiobooks can take days to record, and if you're doing the editing yourself, and if if you're not, then you're going to have to. There are things that you can do. If you're going to record audiobooks yourself and send it out to be edited, then you want to make sure that you are charging enough to be able to afford the outsourcing of the editing and still make money for your hours of recording in the studio. If you're going to just go and record the audio and let the producer edit, that's fine. You can calculate your talent fee. I will say this. You are probably going to need to get to a certain level of performance and demand before that happens. For you to be hired to go into a recording studio and lay the tracks down and leave and let somebody else do all the cleaning up and producing and all that kind of stuff. That's that's after you get to a place, you know. And I'm not even there. That's not my forte. That's not my thing. Any audiobooks that I've done, I've produced in toto for my clients. So read, edit, mix down, master, etc. Uh, and you know, but I charged for it. I I built all those things into my quote. But I, I personally, it's not my thing. I'm not interested in doing audiobooks unless they're my own, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, It's just not my thing. So I'm not the person best suited to mentor you for that. But what I would do is recommend that you check out Pat Fraley. I think he has a workshop. It's called The Billion Dollar Read. And he may offer an online version of that. But if, if you could, he's in California, in L.A. Sometimes he does workshops in uh, New York City. If you want to get serious about it and see what it's all about, I would invest in his workshop. It is totally worth it. I've taken it, and it's helped me. I'll say this about Pat Fraley's workshops. I've taken them with every, and I will say this about workshops in in general. Every workshop I've ever taken has more than paid for itself in what I've been able to take from it, and I've been able to monetize it and at least make my money back, if not more. (laughs) And here's the thing. And people go, oh, I think it's over, I think it's like 1200 bucks to go to Pat's workshop. It might be because he gets other people in the industry. It's not just Pat. He's done awesome audiobooks himself, but he gets people like Scott Brick to come. Big names, Hillary Huber, Stefan Rudnicki. I think he was at my workshop. Big names in the audiobook world to come in and do the workshops with you. And you can't, you can put a price on it because there is a price on it. But if you do it right, you can come away with so much more. And you have to, I've, I say this in pretty much every episode of the, of the podcast, voiceover is a business. It's a fun business, but it's still a business and you have to treat it like a business. So if you were going to open up a store... You're going to have to sign a lease. You're going to have to pay for a lawyer to look over the lease. You're going to have that monthly lease, which is probably going to be triple net, which includes, you know, you're going to be paying for the electricity and the property taxes and the water bill and all that kind of stuff. Uh, You're going to have to have insurance. You're going to have to have inventory. You're going to have to have fixtures. You're going to have to have uh, lights, phone, telecommunications, Internet, whatever. 
Did I mention inventory? You're going to have to have insurance for the inventory. You're going to have to have workers' comp insurance for the employees. You're going to have to have rugs, air conditioning, uh, plowing in the su- in the winter for snow. If you have landscaping or the strip mall that you're renting space from is going to have uh, landscaping fees, it costs a lot of money to set up a business. Believe me, I know I've been there. My family used to be in retail. Why do you think I sell audio? It's not weather dependent, and I don't have to carry an inventory of it. I put it on a hard drive, and I email pixels. Come on. This... (laughs) People are like, oh, I want to get all the information for free. You can't do it for free, and you can't do it yourself. You don't know what you don't know. So you need to go where people who have been there before can share their experiences with you. And so if you try and do this on your own, and I, I would say you're smart, Samita, to want a mentor. I'm not that person for audiobooks. I'm giving you the name of one who is. It's Pat Fraley. And uh, I get nothing for it other than the warm feeling and the confidence of knowing that by going to him, he's going to treat you right. But you need a mentor. People say, oh, I can get all this information on YouTube for free. Well, that's true. You can get some free stuff on YouTube. I offer free stuff. This podcast is free. But it's impossible for me to convey all the nuances, all the subtleties, all the various options. If I'm working with you as a voiceover talent, someone who wants to learn the skills of voiceover, uh, you know, I spend hours. I've had one coaching client for, I think, five years. He started off as a freshman in college, and now he's, he's out of school. And I'm proud to say he is working in a radio station now. He's starting to read scripts and perform with the production department, and he's running the board and all that kind of stuff. And he was willing to um, invest some money in his coaching, and it's paying off for him. And part of what mentors can do that YouTube and other things really aren't that good at is they can put you in positions of success. You can meet people. You, you get to know folks who've been in the business. There's a relationship that's built. Yeah, there's money that's transacted, but you're getting something for that. You're getting experience. You're getting the coaching. You're getting the knowledge. You're buying speed. I think Pat Fraley said that in one of his workshops. I think, see, I think he says that frequently. There's a lot to be said for working with people and paying for your education. You know, Everybody wants free tuition. Well, that, that's nonsense. Nothing's free. Somebody's paying for it. There's a cost to something. Even if I... So here, here we go. I put this podcast out. You can listen to it for nothing. It's a cost to me in terms of time and hosting and all those other things. And I have chosen to do that. I ask for help. I offer uh, products and services and coaching and uh, people take me up on it. So this is a worthwhile endeavor for me. I guess it's my desire to address the reluctance on on a lot of people to willingly invest in themselves. And I get it. We're skeptical. We've been jaded. There's a lot of garbage out there. And I get it. I, I tend to have a jaundiced eye, if you will, toward a lot of things. I, don't, I think if you've been at this for, if you've been involved in life for any length of time, yeah, you know, unfortunately, we live in a world where it's, there's a lot of pretending. And um, you want to know that if you're going to invest something, you're going to get something to it. And even within the voiceover world, you know, the... Come and get your the five hours of voiceover coaching, and then we'll include your demo that you can use, and it's all done for you in eight easy steps. <laughs> that, folks, that ain't real. That's not real. I would be lying to you if I said, yeah, you can do that. I would be doing a disservice to you if I told you that It was easy. It ain't. It ain't easy. It's fun. It's awesome. Once you get started and you get that gig. Let's go back to Andy Packard's email. 72 auditions 
before he landed his first audiobook. That ain't easy. Most people would quit after three auditions and not getting a gig. That's that's the problem with the instant gratification mentality. That's the problem with, oh, I can just get it for free on YouTube or on the internet or through the po- through a podcast. It ain't easy. It's fun. It's a blast. But you got to put the work in. You've got to get the training. You've got to spend some time on it. It doesn't just happen. The professor of harsh reality, <laughs> Dan Kennedy, my marketing mentor, would be proud of me. If, uh, you know, he, he is the professor of harsh reality. I can't, I can't steal that from him, but I'll borrow it. But anybody who's been successful in voiceover or in any career understands that they've had to invest time in learning their craft, their trade. If you're a skilled carpenter, you know, they go through all of these the schools and you become a journeyman, an apprentice, and then you become a, 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 you know, a carpenter. Same thing for plumbers, electricians, any skilled trade. And voice acting is a skill. It's a talent. It's a gift, but it's also a skill that can be developed. And so you have to, you have to spend time on that. Unless you know what to look for, trying to do it all on your own is its a tough task. How would you know what to look for? Samita's done the right thing. She's reached out. She said, you know, what do I need to do to do this? And uh, I think we laid it out for her. So, Samita, I hope you do that. If, um, if you want Pat Fraley's website, go to patfraleyteaches.com. And look for his audiobook workshops, uh, the Billion Dollar Read. He may not call it that anymore, but I know that that's what it was called. And uh, he's your best bet for that genre. So thanks for sending that in, and and congratulations on exploring it. That takes guts. That's the first important step is saying, I want to do this. Now, how do I do it? It reminds me, I know I'm, I'm kind of going on about it, but it reminds me of when I first decided to leave my career in government and politics and campaigns and all of that and saying I wanted to pursue that career, that dream of being in radio. And I didn't really even know all the stuff that was in radio. I knew I, I, knew I liked what I heard. Not all the time, not from everybody, but from certain people. I was like, wow, that would be really cool to do. Um, that would be a lot of fun. And so I can remember I went to Radio Shack, and I bought a microphone, and I plugged it into my stereo system, and I wired it up through my uh, tape deck. I still have all that stuff, by the way. In the early 90s, and I stood there, and I picked up the microphone, and I just I didn't have any structure I, was, I just started babbling. I started making up stuff. And it was within five minutes that I realized, well, this isn't going to cut it. What the heck do I do with this? You know, I've got a microphone. So what? I don't know how to use it. I don't know what to do with it. It was like buying a car and not knowing how to drive it, not knowing how to turn the ignition, not taking a driving lesson, nothing. It's just like, well, got a car in the driveway I can remember my sister she got a bike for her birthday and before she was so excited about the bike but she didn't know how to ride the bike and she was like six seven years old so what did she do she took the bike and she was walking around in circles holding the bike in the driveway she was walking the bike around in circles this is like yeah but I've got this bike but I don't know how to ride it (laughs) <laughs> it was so cute. You can have all the equipment, but if you don't know how to do it, have any kind of structure or format, then you're you're not going to be successful. So, Samita, good for you. And I hope that's helpful. 
Anyway, I've gone on a little bit longer than I expected. I have more questions. Maybe we'll tackle some of those. It's not maybe. We will tackle that in the next episode of the Voice Over Marketing Podcast coming up next week. And I want to thank you for listening. Uh, if you are interested in improving your body, which is your instrument, I invite you to take advantage of the free 30-day trial at Voice Over Athlete Wellness Club. There is a link for you to sign up for free 30 days. Hey, it's the new year. Let's pull a cliche out, say, out of thin air and say, hey, it's the new year. It's the new you. Take care of yourself. Make 2019 the, the year. Now, seriously, I know if you check this out for 30 days, you're going to want to stick around. So, oh, thanks to Christine Cochran for her support and being a member of the VoiceOver Athlete Wellness Club, Diana Birdsall, and others who've joined. Anyway, I'll talk to you next week. I'll talk to you. Blah, 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 blah. Thanks for listening tonight on a very special VoiceOver Marketing Podcast episode. All right, enough of that. Talk to you next week. Our program originates in the Boston studios. We hope you'll join us again. Until then, we bid you au revoir, keep your chin up, and the best of luck. Well, that's it for this episode of the Voice Over Marketing Podcast. If you like this podcast, please subscribe to it at voiceovermarketingpodcast.com so you'll get notices of new episodes. And please share it with your friends and colleagues in the voiceover world. Also, it would be a huge help if you'd like this podcast and rate it on iTunes to help keep it near the top of the list. Feel free to share your comments and questions about this episode and future topics you'd like discussed at voiceovermarketingpodcast.com. And if you'd like more information on one-on-one -on -one coaching with me and mastermind group opportunities where we focus on growing your business, feel free to drop me a line at my cyber assistance email address at mike at johnmelly.com. Thanks for listening. Now go out there and share your voice with the world.